Hello, I'm Dr. Paul from Myra Aesthetics, and today I'm talking about 10 things that you didn't know your cosmetic doctor is doing wrong. You probably didn't think your cosmetic doctor is doing anything wrong, and maybe he isn't actually, to be honest. Maybe he's doing everything right. Maybe I'm doing a lot of things wrong, but over my history of learning about cosmetic treatments for the last 20 years, and doing cosmetic treatments for the last 20 years, and being in three different countries, owning clinics, blah, 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 I've learned a few things, so I thought I might share those things, so that if you are thinking maybe something isn't right, or maybe things could be better, you could benefit from what I know in this video. So keep watching to find out the top 10 things your cosmetic doctor might be doing wrong. This one is a real bugbear for me, not taking photos. And actually, I'm guilty of this because in the past, you know, I was busy, I was trying to build my practice. I didn't have time for taking a camera out, you know, snapping people from uh, different angles. So I uh, I just didn't do it until I went to um, one of my appraisers. I have to do an appraisal every year with the British College of Aesthetic Medicine. So that's the reason I started taking photos because my appraiser said between this year and next year, what I want you to do is take photos. And um, so I reluctantly did it maybe a few years into my cosmetic career. Now I wouldn't trade it for the world. It's essential because I started taking photos of people. You know, it was a nuisance at first. It was taking maybe almost twice as long to do a consultation. But then I get people to come back in for a checkup and I would notice things. I'd notice details that I 100% would not have remembered. Botox takes two weeks to work, so I would have completely forgotten what someone's frown line looked like, how much better it was or wasn't, if I didn't have the before photo and the after photo. So by looking at these pictures, I've learned a lot about treatments and what makes treatments more or less natural. It's only by putting a before picture of a forehead beside an after picture and noticing how high the eyebrows are before and a small millimeter difference that you might say, oh, you're getting slightly too much across here, so your eyebrow is gonna be slightly heavy. Not only does that allow me to get one individual's treatment better, but it also allows you to learn from things that you don't even realize are mistakes because they're very, very small problems. So it gets you very good at fine tuning. Your doctor needs to be taking photos before and after at least for one of your Botox treatments and for all of your filler treatments. Sticking to the standard dose. So I've touched on that doctors can be a little bit by the book, a little bit, a little bit boring. Um, and we like to do stuff that's by the regulations because we don't want to, you know, we don't want don't to get struck off. We don't want to get in trouble. We just do what's supposed to be done. Unfortunately, the guys who make the dermal filler, the guys who make Botox, they tell us things that I think might not be 100% true. So, for example, Botox has a licensed therapeutic dose. That means in between the eyebrows for Botox, you're supposed to use 20 units. Across the forehead, you're supposed to use 12 units. And around the eyes, you're supposed to use 20 units. Now, I have found that on the eyes, for example, I will use as little as three units on each eye, so six units out of a recommended 20, and as much as 40 units. So it's a huge, huge difference um, to, to what's recommended. So someone who's getting only six is getting only a third of what's recommended, and someone who's getting 40 is getting double what's recommended. Now, if I only ever did what they recommended, I would have a lot of people, because really people sit way outside the, the recommended dose, I would have a lot of people who aren't getting enough, and I, but more so I'd have a lot of people who are getting way too much. I think the guys who make Botox, they recommend using more than what the average required amount is, and I think the reason for that is because obviously it makes financial sense. Same way as on some creams it will say apply liberally so they recommend using loads because they make more money similarly with filler they tell doctors that it lasts six months so you have a lot of doctors using fillers every six months redoing people's lips but the truth is filler lasts a lot longer than six months i've had people having filler and people who've come back years later have said i haven't done it for years but i think maybe it's gone I'll take the photos, refer to the earlier point of taking photos. I'll look at the photos since it's been done. I'll look at the new photos. I'll look at the original treatment and we'll both marvel at how the filler that's supposed to only last six months is still there three, four years later. Using too much Botox, uh, for example, just looks rubbish. The face is a machine. It's like a car engine insofar as it has a, about 50 different moving parts in it. You know, there are a lot of different muscles in your face that do all sorts of different things, smile, lift, da 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 da. So 50 muscles on each side of your face. Now, if you had a car engine that was revving too much, would you just remove a part from that car engine? Or would you maybe try and tune that part so that it works a little bit less crazy? That's what we're doing with Botox. We're trying to turn down, tone down muscles. A lot of people use the word freeze, frozen, um, paralyze, but this is completely wrong. If you're paralyzing muscles, you're removing a part of the engine and then the face doesn't work. Now, what is this engine supposed to do? This engine is supposed to communicate. So if I want to tell you that I'm angry without speaking, I can do that. Or if I want to be surprised, or if I want to be not impressed, I can make different faces using different combinations of muscles. 
Each muscle is like a word in your facial vocabulary. Now, if you remove a couple of words, you literally can't say certain things anymore. A lot of people think that's fine, it's no big deal. But if you're a young mom and you have kids that are, you know, can't speak yet, the only way they can communicate is by your face. You need to have your face active at least a little bit so that you can say the things that need to be said with your face. If you're in the workplace, you need to empathize, you need to explain things. So don't switch off your face and don't use too much Botox. That's why I use very small amounts for people sometimes because I use just enough to make sure that the lines are gone but the face can still do what it's supposed to do. If your cosmetic doctor is doing whatever you say, then that's another big mistake. One of the hardest things I learned as a cosmetic doctor is although I am not an expert on beauty per se and a lot of my patients will know more about applying makeup will know more about what they want their lips or their cheeks or their under eyes to look like i shouldn't do whatever people say because people as i've mentioned earlier on can be a little bit biased we all have our own bugbears and if we have one line that's annoying us particularly bad or one area that we think is underdeveloped we can really blow it out of proportion so a person can come in and get their lips done who doesn't maybe need them done in the first place and then they can go away come back six months later and say hey i need to do my lips again and then they can go away and come back and say hey i need to do my lips again so this is a huge mistake that cosmetic doctors do their first job is to say no. So if someone wants something that actually they don't need, saying no is the first job of a cosmetic doctor. If your cosmetic doctor is doing exactly what you say and not debating with you what's best for your face, that's a huge mistake that I see a lot. Not suggesting the key thing, but suggesting many things. Now, why is this a problem? Who cares if your doctor tells you loads of different things? The reason why this is a bad thing, if your cosmetic doctor is telling you lots of things to do, is because of the reason why people get treatments in the first place. The main reason women get treatments done, and men, is to feel confident. So when a woman comes in with one problem, maybe she has one line or one thing that she wants to improve, if she goes into the doctor, and I've heard this loads of times from people who've gone to see my colleagues, and the doctor kind of goes, yes, that's interesting, you have, a, you have a problem there. Did you know you also have 17 other problems uh, on your face? Now, that obviously is gonna make the person feel terrible if you point out 17 different problems when they only thought they had one. So the person leaves with terrible confidence, Often they don't get treatments done because they just feel they don't trust that person after being insulted. And then a lot of those people will come to me and they'll say, I went to this doctor and they told me I need 10 things. People use it as an upselling strategy, as a technique to do more treatments. But the thing that people want is not to be perfect. It is to feel good. It is to feel confident by either treating the thing that annoys them the most and making sure that is the correct thing to treat, that it's actually treatable and there isn't something that's much easier to treat, much cheaper to treat, that'll make a much bigger difference. Uh, that's how you build confidence for people. Not keeping up with technology. This is another one that I've been guilty of in the past. Um, for example, there's a new treatment, not new now, it's about five years old, I guess. It's called Profilo, 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 or Profiteroles as one of my patients calls it. This treatment has been around for some time, but I wasn't onto it for the first little while because I'm, I was quite nervous with keeping up with all the latest things. So one of my doctors in my clinic in Dublin, Mylene, she she told me, you know, this profile stuff, it's pretty good. We should, we should try it out. So I let her try it out. I was like, we'll see. I'm not sure how, how good it's going to be. And now it's made, made up about a third of the different treatments that we do. It's one of our most popular treatments. So if your doctor is stuck in, you know, 2002 and is just doing the exact same doses of Botox, is doing the exact same techniques with lip filler, things aren't going to look great. Things are going to look like 20 years ago. As I say, this industry is so new, this technology is moving so fast, people are coming up with new ideas, new techniques, new procedures, new products, new ways of doing things, and complete, com new complete different classes of uh, treatments. If your doctor's not keeping up with the latest things, then you're missing out on a lot. The corollary to that, the opposite to that, is that if your doctor is only doing the latest things and is only doing the next big thing, the big new thing, they might be susceptible to being over-marketed machines and they might buy machines that are not the best treatments. A lot of new treatments come along and go. So your doctor needs to be keeping up with technology, but they also need to be a little bit skeptical and cynical and not just getting all the latest technology. Not planning is another big mistake that people make. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So when you want to get a treatment done, you need to sit down and decide in order of priority, what are the most important things to do. But if a person has a long 
long list of things that they want to treat, we take the top five, the ones that will make the biggest difference for the smallest cost, the smallest time, the smallest risk of bruising, etc. And we do those things in order of which will make the biggest impact. Now, when we have that plan in place, we could do just one thing. And sometimes you do just one thing and the person, their confidence has gone from, you know, 50% up to 90%. Now, you could do four more things. But how much more confident can you feel than 90%? And when you're 99% confident, do you feel that much better than when you're 90%? It's the law of diminishing returns. It will cost a lot more to get closer to perfect. And the reality is you never can be perfect. So we focus on what will make the biggest difference. And the difference we're trying to make is in terms of confidence. Now that is an objective thing. Other people will be able to see confidence. Sorry, other people will give you confidence by looking at you and doing a double take and going, oh, you look, you look good. So if people look at you and notice that you look good or if you get compliments or if people stop saying you look tired, for example, these things build confidence and doing everything isn't necessary to achieve that. Being too cheap. So a lot of doctors, especially in the UK, are competing with people with no qualifications. They're doing cosmetic treatments like Botox and fillers. Literally, you know, your car mechanic could do it legally in the UK. Not Botox, but fillers. There are very little regulations on that. So doctors who've spent a lot of time training are competing with that. And they're kind of going, how can I compete with someone who's doing lip filler for 99 pounds? I went to college for six years. I learned about these techniques and these treatments for 20 years. So if I do it for 99 pounds I'll make after tax a lot of the other guys don't even pay tax after tax I'll make you know 10 15 15 pounds and it'll take me half an hour an hour to do so you can't expect your doctor <laughs> to work for you know minimum wage and if your doctor is prepared to work for minimum wage you need to wonder do they actually know what they're doing um, because that it doesn't make sense they've spent a long time to learn the skills be specialized in that area. So they need to charge appropriately. And if they're charging appropriately, then they don't have to rush people. They can take more time drawing, planning your treatment, and then you get the best results. Remember, this is not like fast fashion. Your face is the slowest fashion there is, and there's no fashion to it. Beauty is timeless. Beauty has been the same, more or less, for thousands of years. And if you get treatment done, you're gonna have to wear that for a long time. So don't think about it as being, I'm just gonna do the cheapest option. Do something that's going to look good every day for a long time. So the next mistake cosmetic doctors make, which is a real bugbear of mine, is not doing checkups. Economically, it makes sense. So you see them twice for the same amount of money. Of course, a lot of doctors are like, well, that's a that's a waste of that's a waste of time. I could see twice as many people instead of doing checkups. This is all wrong. Your doctor needs to see you. Your doctor needs to see exactly what's worked and what hasn't worked. Your doctor needs to fine tune, especially in the first few treatments. If they're not seeing you back for a checkup with photos, especially the first few times, then your results are more than likely wrong because the dose, for example, in one area can be from six units on the eyes up to 40 units. And if they just guess a number or worse, if they just take the number that the guys who make the product suggest, you're probably getting way too much or maybe you're getting not enough or maybe it's being applied incorrectly for your particular muscles. Your photos need to be taken, they need to be checked, and that needs to be done. So checkups might seem like a waste of time for doctors, but the results just are nowhere near as good if you're not doing checkups. Not dissolving the work. A lot of doctors are afraid to tell you that your filler looks rubbish. And sometimes they're afraid because they did the rubbish filler. Sometimes it's not the doctor's fault. Filler has this characteristic called Tyndall lines. Now it was much worse 20 years ago with the first fillers. 30 years ago they used to use collagen, then they moved on to hyaluronic acid that was dissolvable. Then they moved on to shorter chain hyaluronic acids, um, which is more like our own body's kind of hyaluronic acid. The problem with filler is the longer it sits in your skin, it kind of organizes itself and it can begin to appear a little bit blue. So you can get a bluish tinge underneath the eyes, much more common with cheaper fillers and much more common with older fillers and also more common with filler that's been there for a long time. So when you see this bluish, bluish tinge or if you see that the filler is drawing a lot of water into itself, you might see puffiness underneath the eyes, that filler needs to be dissolved. Another place this happens is on the lips where filler will wear away in some areas like the sides, but not so much in the center. The best course of action is to dissolve and start fresh. The other thing is patients will never tell the doctor or very rarely tell the doctor that the filler needs to be dissolved. Patients have spent money on the filler. They don't want to dissolve it because they feel like it's a waste of money, but it's the doctor's job to let a person know that looks bad, it needs to be taken out even if the doctor's the one who put that in. So that about sums up this video, 10 things your cosmetic doctor might be doing wrong. If there's anything in particular you disagree with or agree with or anything I might've forgotten, let me know in the comments below. I will try to reply to all your comments. If there's anything particularly outrageous or amazing that your doctor does, let me know and I will see you in the next video.